All right. How you doing, John. guys? How's everyone? Good, John. Roy, how are you, man? How's everything? Roy, how you doing? So, you guys, if you could do me a favor as you come in inside the chat box, if you just type in your name, uh, where you're coming from, or where you live right now, and then and where you coach currently, just so I can kind of have a list of of your experiences and where you guys are kind of working uh, currently. So again, name, where you live and where you coach, and that, that should be sufficient. And we'll get started in a couple more minutes. As you know, as in most times in life, most people come late, so. How's everything down in uh, Louisiana, Power? We're, we're doing well, John. We, we got some more rain today again, so um you know in in the city it's been it's been pretty bad um yesterday and today and today we were supposed to start our our training and we got uh we got uh, canceled because of uh flooding on our field so we have to wait gotcha 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 well hopefully i know you guys are a little bit ahead of us with regards to the situation so hopefully you can make the the best of uh of your time. Yeah. Right now we're just prepping for tryout. So. so guys, I know some of you guys are new that just jumped in here. If you could just type into the chat box, uh, name, where you coach, and then uh, where you're from, where you guys are coming from. I know most of you guys are probably from Eastern New York, but I know we have a couple of people out of state that are running in as well. So I appreciate it. And do me a favor, if you guys could also mute yourself, that'd be great. Just because it's uh, it gets a little bit difficult to be able to talk over. And we'll get started. We're gonna get started in a couple minutes here. Just wait for a couple more people that are looking to jump in. How you doing, Roy? How's everything? Nice. You know, like, uh, it's supposed to rain. I'm going down to Pennsylvania tomorrow. Right. And uh, I don't know what the weather's going to be like down there, but, you know, I'm going to be down there for a couple of days. Baseball tournament? What's that? Baseball tournament? <laughs> <laughs> Baseball. The good old days. Good old days. Uh, so guys, for the last bunch of uh, people that just jumped in, just name where you're from and then uh, where you coach, just so I can kind of get engaged uh, where the group is. Um, again, I want to say thank you for you guys jumping on the call and, and taking the time to uh, listen to this presentation. And then if you could just, as you come on, just remute yourself um, so that we don't have any extra out exterior noise here. We'll get started. Let's see. Power, right, I want to see if anyone beat you. Uh, we, got, we, got, we got a lot of Pittsburgh and, and Western PA here, upstate New York. We got a little bit, of, we got, uh, who else? 
whole contingency from Pittsburgh. Thank you guys for coming on, I appreciate it. All right, so we'll get started guys. Again, I'll, uh, I'll try and keep in mind anyone else that jumps on here. Um, but I'm gonna share my screen. So if you guys could just, again, if you're not muted, if you could just mute yourself, please, so that we don't have any background noise as I'm speaking. And we will get started here. Okay. All right, guys, so I first want to say thank you for, for jumping on tonight. Um, I know, obviously, uh, weather's starting to get nice. Um, you know, we're all cooped up here in this, in this quarantine period, and we just want to get back out to, to working with our players. So I appreciate you taking the time on this Wednesday night to, to come sit here and listen to my presentation. My name is John Ciano. Uh, I'm, an inst uh, again, part of uh, Tim Bradbury's instructional coaching education staff for Eastern New York. I'm also the head men's soccer coach at the College of St. Rose, and I also work again in, in the uh, youth ranks with um, club up here in the Albany area, and then with uh, Region One in Eastern New York ODP. So, as we get going here, just pre presentation protocols. I know we're all professionals here, but again, I just want to reiterate: if you just mute yourself as you come on, or uh, or again, if you're kind of unmuted right now, just please, if you just take a look and make sure that you're muted so that I can be as, as clear as possible. Uh, also just, again, I, no fooling around with the annotation tools. Uh, if you have a question, uh, I'll either ask you to unmute yourself and you can, you know, again, say your piece, or if you feel more comfortable typing into the chat box, you can drive it into me privately and, and I can answer your question there. And uh, again, just, I, I want you to feel safe here. So again, this is a safe learning environment. Uh, be respectful of others' uh, opinions and, and be open-minded. So icebreaker, and in honor of uh, the La Liga getting started tomorrow, uh, we've got some La Liga trivia. So if you have a pen and paper, you can keep score at home. We're looking for five out of five for the answers here. But you have a minute, take a look at the five questions. No cheating as we say in the virtual world here. No cheating, but see if you can get, again, uh, all five answers, all right? So we'll go over them in a minute, and your time starts now. Thirty seconds. La Liga, in honor of again this the another big league kicking off in Europe tomorrow. La Liga trivia. Fifteen more seconds. Five more seconds. Get rack your brain. Get those answers down. And time, all right, pencils down, all right? We're going to look for five or five, you get the golden star. Question one, Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo are the top two gold scorers in La Liga history. Who's number three? Correct Just answer, Tom oh. Zara. Real Madrid forward, 40s and 50s. Question number two, Atletico Madrid won La Liga title in 2013-14. Who was the, the team before that who was not named Barcelona or Real Madrid to win? Correct answer was Valencia in 2003-04, coached by Rafa Benitez. Question number three. Only three teams to have never been relegated from the first division of Spanish football since its inception in 1929. I'm sure you got two of the three answers, but did anyone have Athletic Bilbao? So again, Bilbao, Barcelona, Real Madrid. Question four, the top 10 list for most goals scored in a season features Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo nine times. Who is the only other player to feature on this list? Correct answer is Luis Suarez, 2015-16 with Barcelona. And last question for all the coaches out there, what manager has won the most La Liga titles? 
If you had Miguel Munoz with Real Madrid, you got it correct. Hopefully you had a couple of five or fives here. So my presentation, and this is kind of the game plan. I'm cutting up in, in, in sort of a game format here. We'll go over the pregame prep talk, okay, objectives and goals. First half of the presentation, uh, again, which today is on uh, first training session back, what should it look like? We'll talk more specifically about the safety protocols and procedures. Uh, we go into the halftime. And then after that, we go into protocols and procedures. Um, so our halftime, go to questions. Second half, first training back, designing and training. And then post-game analysis to wrap up conclusions and questions. Give me one second, guys. Oh, perfect. All right. So on to the pregame pep talk. Okay, so really I want to keep this as basic and as simple as possible. So we're going to talk about just two goals and objectives I want to take away. Uh, first, I want you to introduce you the protocols and procedures to keep in uh, mind when we're returning back to play. Uh, I know there's a lot of confusion with the, the phases uh, with regards to U.S. soccer, but also, again, a lot of uh, uncertainty and, and confusion when it comes to the phases of reopening for, for New York State. Uh, and then the second part is I want to dive into best practices and I want to, again, share ideas for maybe designing and implementing training for your first session when we return. Okay, so first half, safety protocols and procedures. So we're all prepped up and ready to go. So again, we're ready, we're excited, we want to get back out. We got our whistle on, we're lacing up our boots but there's things that we have to keep in mind before we get outside. So when you close your eyes, these are probably some of the questions you're asking yourself as we start to prepare for, again, life after COVID with training. Uh, what phase are we in? So again, as I mentioned, a lot of confusion with, with especially with our state here in New York, and I'm sure with the states from, from where you guys are coming from out there. Uh, what is mandated and recommended by public health organizations, especially with the CDC? What is mandated and recommended by your local, state, and federal governments? And then what is mandated and recommended by your governing soccer body? And again, in, in our country, obviously we have, a, we have U.S. soccer, but you also have again, U.S. YS, you have U.S. club, which, which has uh, some procedures that are a little bit different. Uh, we're specifically gonna talk from, from the U.S. soccer standpoint. Okay, this will be more in line with U.S. YS. So what did the state of New York do? They, they put together some metrics to uh, decide when we we're going to be able to kind of start this reopening process. So as you can see, the, the state of New York's cut into 10 regions. Uh, they put together a seven metric um, procedure where, again, you had to pass all seven metrics when it came to the decline of COVID before you could start reopening, uh, according to Governor Cuomo. So as you can kind of take a look, um, and again, this is something you, uh, when I show you at the end of my presentation, I have a couple of resources you'll be able to find on your own. Uh, but that was pretty interesting. Again, as we talked about the 10 regions for the state of New York, all right, eight of which are in what's called phase two. And then due to the volume and the amount of cases of COVID down in New York City and Long Island, they are still in phase one. What goes into reopening, which I think is important to know. So uh, what we would call maybe phase zero, which was uh, again, staying at home in shelter, the only people that were really working were essential workers, essential businesses. Now phase one is starting to go into the non-essentials. Um, as you can see, phase two, which the majority of the state is now able to, again, enjoy these kind of uh, amenities. Phase three and phase four, and as at the bottom of phase four, you can see I highlighted recreation. It's highlighted because that's what youth soccer falls on. So even though we'll start, hopefully start into phase one of soccer's five phase plan, we need to be in phase four before that occurs. And that's where it lies a lot of the confusion. Okay, so again, recommendations and guidelines by U.S. Soccer, the what U.S. Soccer called the U.S. Soccer Play On or the Return to Play five phase overview. It starts with the phase zero at stay in shelter and finishes up with phase four with no restrictions. These are in my words, but purposes of the five phases. Uh, one, and most importantly, just to reduce and kind of cut the, the curve of a, of a COVID-19 resurgence. 
So do we want to mitigate and, and kind of eliminate all possibilities? Uh, the other two, again, are, are more for safety protocols when it comes to our players, but to reduce the possibility of injury after prolonged inactivity, which makes sense. And then to allow players to integrate gradually as the players start to gain that physical overload and start to come back and gain fitness. So it's, it's an increment-based program to allow us to get back to soccer as we know. Phase zero, which was stay in shelter and what we currently are in. Again, the, the thought process was stay at home, stay out of contact, bend the curve. Uh, obviously, no organized group trainings or competitions. Uh, I'm sure, <laughs> including myself, have had more than a vir enough virtual trainings to last a lifetime. But these Zoom meetings have become the norm and are probably here to stay. I'm sure with your clubs and your teams, you've done tons of tactical webinars, guest speakers, individual core workouts, whatever it may be, um, and these were highly encouraged. Phase one, which is hopefully what we'll be getting into by the time we get into phase four of the state, individual and small group training. Again, U.S. soccer is suggesting four to five weeks. This is based upon, again, your local and state guidelines when this can be lifted with regards to regulations. The big key here to know is that this is 10 participants max, so nine players and a coach. And obviously, to, to, to continue to mitigate the, the possibilities, maintain social distancing, and following that COVID-19 protocol. Phase two, and how I best kind of state this, it's it really it's an, an, an ex extension of phase one. Um, another three to six additional weeks, okay, and this is being used to track, again, a lot of the COVID-19 cases and to, to make sure that we're on the right path. But really the big thing to know here is instead of just being limited to 10, or 10 people that can participate, now the entire team can participate. But on the field, social distancing must be maintained and we must proceed with the COVID-19 protocols. Phase three, this is now what you would kind of consider soccer as we knew it, okay? Full team competitions, full training, get those shin pads on, Stick some tackles, you know, a little bit more, again, close proximity type of training. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, tournaments, games can all occur now. Um, you're going to still continue with the protocols. A couple rec recommendations from U.S. Soccer. Prioritize local and one-game events, okay? So when, what they're trying to do, again, is try and limit the, the possibility of, of spreading the disease and the possibility of attracting it, okay? So... Uh, obviously, staying local, you don't have to travel as much, and then playing one-game events as opposed to larger tournaments limits in the number of people you're going to come in contact with. Um, and obviously, just be aware of, of any public health regulations or, or laws regarding uh, large events and so forth. And then phase four, no restrictions. It's not deemed a public health matter again anymore. Everything's lifted. So here's a, a table that was sent to us. Uh, from Tim, uh, and this is regarding, uh, these are, uh, let, me, let me state this, predicted and tentative uh, return dates, okay? So as you can see on the left, it's all the regions within Eastern New York. And then going from left to right, you have when you uh, are predicted to enter phase four for the reopening for New York State, and then the, the correlating phases with regards to U.S. soccer. So the thing to really keep in mind is that each region is a little different. So for example, I live up in Albany, which is part of the Capital District. We are predicted to be in phase four starting July 3rd. So we are then predicted to be in phase one of US soccer on July 3rd. Whereas if you're in New York City, you're having to wait almost an additional month. The thing to also keep in mind is that again, as I mentioned before, this is tentative. So who knows with regards to resurgence to viruses and cases, this could go backwards, this could start later. We just don't know. So again, to kind of reiterate, you can go back a phase. And things to keep in mind is this is based on your reality. So if multiple infections occur, if there's an inability to follow the protocols, if there's an inability to isolate, um, you can always go back. And I think that's the really, it's gonna be down to what your reality is with regards to your region and regards to the, the health protocols you have to follow within um, your local and state government. Okay, so safety protocols. So this is everything kind of before we, before we get to the field and before we get to the session. Um, so hopefully again, with your club, you've already started to put together some plans. 
You've already started to communicate with your players and parents about the health and safety guidelines. Uh, some are very simple, right? So basic hygiene, wash your hands, cough into your sleeve, make sure you wear a mask when you're in public. But here are some of the ones that I found a little bit more prominent. And this is all stuff that you can find on US Soccer's website, um, specifically when it comes to phase one with the grassroots recommendations. But here, here were some, like I said, the, the, the big takeaways. Uh, U.S. Soccer, and I believe the CDC has, has dictated that one of, uh, a temperature greater than 100.4 to be a symptom of COVID. So you have that, stay home. Um, do not attend training if you, again, have been exposed within the past 14 days. Um, you're going to have to go through that quarantine period. If previously tested, and this is a big one, make sure you, again, get that clearance from the physician, and you must have get retested to come up with, again, negative status. Uh, with regards to traveling, make sure, again, that you're uh, traveling with as few people as possible. Hopefully, your club has already started to put together signage and safety protocols and directions at the fields. Regularly disinfect uh, places where you have high volumes of traffic, uh, benches, bathrooms, locker rooms, etc. And then strict guidelines for drop off and pick up. Safety protocols with regards to gear and equipment. Uh, if you can, players should obviously have their own water bottles and gear ready to go. Uh, you're going to see I, I have something kind of designated as a, um, a designated preparation zone. But again, even a little bit safer is for players to get ready at home. Uh, min minimal equipment for setup when possible. Disinfect, again, equipment. Uh, disinfect bowls. If you can even supply the bowls yourself, uh, you're going to mitigate the, the circumstances. Don't allow the players to pick up cones and gear and don't share pennies. Uh, I read somewhere, which I thought was a pretty uh, cool idea, was even if you maybe give a player your, uh, a penny and then that's kind of their penny for the phase one, they can go home, they can wash it, they can learn some things about responsibility and accountability, uh, but you know your team best. Yeah, I, I know, I'm sure we all have those players that are, are probably gonna forget that penny, so it's up to you. So now we're at halftime. Um, and I know there was a lot of information to digest, does anyone have any specific questions that they may want answered? Okay, I'll take that as a no, we'll progress on. Second half, first practice back. So designing the session, okay? And we're gonna look at the designing piece and then we're gonna look at obviously implementing and what the, that looks like as well. So things to kind of think about and know about, about our players, okay? And I think this is a really big piece because um, again, this is something, this, this pandemic is something that we could have never predicted. It's something that our players have, have never experienced. Um, I was talking to a coach before. Uh, again, this is a, a generation of, of individuals that have never had a lot of real hardships before in terms of society or current events. They've never really gone through a war. Uh, a lot of them didn't experience obviously 9-11, if any, to be honest. So again, COVID-19 and obviously the publicized uh, racial injustices are, are big events for these kids. And it, it would do us, it, it'd be an injustice for us to be, to, to underestimate that going into these, these training sessions. Uh, some things more directly that impact uh, COVID-19. You know, were they sick themselves? Uh, did they have, again, someone that was close to them, a loved one who got sick or, or even worse, that passed away from, from the illness? Um, lack of social interaction is huge, huge with these kids. Okay, they, they're not getting to see their friends. A lot of them are not getting to see their extended family, specifically uh, the elderly in their family. And this is probably going to lead to greater causes of depression and, and anxiety in these individuals. Uh, social angst at home. This is a big one. Okay, with this pandemic, it's causing a lot of financial burdens at home, and and really just a, a lot of stressors and, and angst. And and again, I think we've been naive to think that these stressors don't uh, affect our kids and kind of seep into them. And then some basic ones: uh, higher reliance on technology. I mean, we were going in this direction for years and years before, but this kind of expedited. What better excuse than to play video games now with, the, with having to be in a lockdown? Uh, social media, Netflix. I mean, I, I think I binged Tiger Kings, Mad Men, and, and everything else like everybody else. Um, but with that, again, overall lack of physical activity. We would like to think that, the, that our players were out, they were training, you know, they were doing extra stuff on their own. But the reality is, 
the majority probably were not. And then obviously, what is to come? Anxious, uncertain, and who knows? Um, so now, okay, and what I'd like you to do is if you can type it in the chat box, all right, um, what to consider? What are some things we should consider when planning our training session? So what are some things now that maybe come to mind to you when you're looking to plan this training session? What are some things maybe that you think are important? I'll give you a minute. If you type in the chat box, I'd love to hear and, and see what you have to say. Remember, we have a safe environment here. No wrong answers. Love your participation. Okay, we have, I see fitness levels, decreased fitness levels. Great. I think those are awesome answers. Okay, number of participants, equip needed. about 30 more seconds if you have anything else you want to add uh, again guys i appreciate your participation i think it makes makes the presentation Perfect. thank you malcolm injury prevention low intensity getting back into it good staffing that's needed okay perfect so those are all some really great answers and I'm just gonna remind, if you, if you just jumped in, if you could please mute yourself, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I'd make things a lot more clear. Okay, so here's some of the things that I had jotted down, just to keep in mind, and some again are a little more obvious than others, but again, what phase are we in? Um, I know you're probably saying, well, duh, coach, we're, we're gonna be in phase one, but uh, these things will always change. Uh, what's developmentally appropriate? So the activities, hopefully, that you're gonna run for a U9 player is not gonna be the same that uh, you're going to have for U19. Um, where are your players mentally and psychologically, as we mentioned? Um, what do your players need from that regard? Where are they, they coming from? Uh, is the environment safe? And, and I'm going to talk about it from, from a physical standpoint, but also, again, from a mental standpoint. Um, you know, what have the players been doing over the break? Uh, as we talked about before, hopefully you guys were doing something with regards to uh, virtual training or something of that nature. Um, is it in line with what you were doing virtually? So uh, did you kind of put together a plan that is now going to kind of integrate into phase one? And then what is your club's development curriculum or periodization structure? So has your club already put something together for you to now start to implement? Okay, and now how can we meet our players? Okay, so when I say that, you know, what are some things that we can do or, or what are some things that, that we can be for our players uh, when it comes time to the training? And uh, I'll give you about a minute, all right? And then I'm gonna start just uh, calling for some, maybe some volunteers that wanna step in and maybe uh, talk about some things that they think. So how can we meet our players' needs? And, more, and specifically what I'm looking for is what are some things that we can do to create the best environments so that the, the players get what, what they need out of these first couple of sessions, or specifically the first session in general. So take a minute, think about it, jot some things down on a piece of paper, and then you can either, like I said, uh, you can write to me individually in the chat box if you wanna participate, or if you wanna unmute yourself, I'd love to hear from anybody. Okay, I'll give you a couple more seconds here. Okay. Uh, 
Libby, maybe you want to, could you uh, unmute yourself and maybe say what you typed into the group? Sure. Um, I do this anyway, but usually every practice, every session, I check in during the 90 minutes with each player and just ask them how school is, ask them how their sister's doing, their brother, just kind of let them talk about how they're feeling. I think this is a really important time to do that because we, we really don't have any idea how they're going to feel this first training session back. Absolutely. And it sounds like you build good rapport already, so that should come pretty seamless when you get back. So that's awesome. Thank you, Libby. Sure. Uh, Malcolm, can you maybe part, uh, uh, kind of uh, say to the group what you had written down? Yeah, I think it's good that we hear from the kids to, to kick off the first session. Uh, I think all the kids are going to have experience at different situations. It's good to get feedback from them, have a brief chat with them, find out where they're at, ask a few questions, and and let them chit chat with their teammates a, a little bit. I know we got to respect the spacing and distancing, but a brief intro and chit chat would be good for them. Completely agree. Thank you, Malcolm, for sharing. And then uh, maybe Leslie, would you mind sharing what you had written down in the chat box? Sure. So um, I wrote in, you know, basically it's going to be more of a social interaction for these, some of these kids. This might be the first time that they're out in a, in a bigger group section, session. Um, so we might see more acting out. So we're going to have to um, figure out how to individual, individually meet with them and talk to them individually and care for what they now have been going through these past couple months. So we also have to be supportive um, in those actions that well, as well that might be occurring. Awesome, I think that's excellent. Thank you for sharing. Sure. Um, so all great answers and I love where you guys went with it. Um, so here's some of the things I wrote and, and as you can see, I made a little a little boo-boo here. I should have had the, uh, the first come out, but whatever. Um, here we are. Okay, these are the things that I kind of thought that first came to mind for me. Uh, what do we need to do? And obviously, how do we need to be the first day? Um, you know, I think everything stems from passion and enthusiasm, right? So uh, I'll use a, a campfire reference or, or a um, Hopefully, obviously, it's not too cold now for a uh, fireplace, but with our players, uh, you're either going to have to be the stoke, so a stoke that, you know, fans the flame to make it even brighter and higher, or for some of these players, you have to be the match to start the fire itself. So um, I think if, if we're not enthusiastic and passionate, and, and, and I, I know I'm dying to be out there, and I'm sure you guys are too, then I think we're, we're missing the boat. You know, and I think one of the big silver linings I, I hope that kids take away from this time off is they have a greater appreciation for, for practice, for competing, and for just playing the game that they love. Uh, but we have to bring that enthusiasm and, and, and passion or else we're doing these kids a, a, a disservice. Uh, empathy, extra kindness and understanding at this point, right? So, uh, and a couple of you guys mentioned it, you know, we don't know what the, these kids have been going through. Um, you know, and hopefully you, you built good rapport over this break with, with your, your players, more so as persons and people as, as opposed to just players. But develop that empathy, you know, and, and make sure that you're there for them. Positivity, 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 right? Can you be positive? Um, you know, there's going to be mistakes. There's going to be, uh, again, maybe kids, uh, you know, acting out and that, that social aspect. But can we stay as positive as possible? Uh, lower your expectations, not your standards. And when I say this, I mean, uh, you can't expect these kids to be the finished product when they come back. And I know some of us work with novice or grassroots players, some of us work with more elite players, but I think at the end of the day, uh, everyone's gonna come back a little rusty. Everyone's gonna come back maybe a little bit different than when they first left. And we need to keep this in the back of mind as we're coaching our players. Make sure, again, the session is developmentally appropriate. I can't hit this home enough. Obviously, you're not going to work on the same skill base set uh, with a, a nine-year-old as you would with a 19-year-old. And then lead from the front. You know, there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, craziness on that first day. Kids are going to want to hug and high-five and not wear their masks and everything else. But can we be the role models and follow the guidelines more? more, more and like I said, lead, lead from the front. So now we're on the training day. 
Okay, so training protocols as we arrive. Uh, hopefully you had a plan in place to, to almost uh, have a specific group to work with each other for the entire phase one. So again, for phase one, it's only nine players and a coach. Try and keep those players together as much as possible through this phase so that you mitigate the possibility of spreading the virus. Uh, equipment and field set ahead of time, considering social distancing. Again, we talk about the five elements of a training session. Organization is the key. It's the biggest and the most important one. Designate entrance time and location. This is huge to, again, mitigate the possibility of spread through, through contact. Um, this is a pretty interesting one, creating a check-in station when possible, keeping attendance. So obviously just to see who's there, but also when you're keeping track, God forbid there is, there's an outbreak with regards to the virus, you, you have the, the data and, and statistics right there. Uh, obviously maintain social distancing, wear a mask when needed. Um, there's a screen participant list, like a checklist created by the CDC called Coronaviruses uh, Self-Checker. This is something that each club should have when, when checking people in. And then uh, obviously if you can have any sand sanitizer and things like that. Uh, preparation area obviously helps. So hopefully kids get changed bef before they come. But again, designate an area where obviously you are making sure that they respect the, the six feet, but they're able to change and get ready and uh, even maybe mentally prepare themselves for the session. Best practices. So things to kind of keep in mind throughout the session. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm with, uh, in lockstep with Malcolm with this. I think we need to leave time for social collaboration. I think this will be the biggest piece that's obviously the kids have been missing as they come back. You want to follow the COVID protocols. You want to have the six, you know, uh, feet of, of social distancing, the masks, but allow the kids to, to talk and communicate. Um, no huddles, handshakes, high fives, set up guidelines always for the what ifs. So again, injury, sickness, if someone does obviously come down with the virus, uh, obviously you have protocols when it comes to weather, keep stoppages to a minimum, uh, extra time for water breaks and so forth. Obviously if the, the players are gonna fatigue a lot quicker. And then big part, we talk about again, the building blocks for player development, fun and development. Uh, it's gotta be fun guys. Make sure that you keep it, keep it fun. Okay, and then what I'm gonna show you now is a couple different examples. So uh, I'll show you two examples of sessions that for, are for phase one. And then when I first got asked to do this presentation, my first inclination was when we talk about first training session back, I almost thought of like what soccer was when we, when we left and what we probably look at phase three. Uh, so I'll give you kind of uh, my feedback on that as well. So phase one, uh, again, to duration 60 minutes max, nine players, one coach, uh, no heading or handling. This is a big thing is including the goalkeeper. So I know our, our goalkeepers want to jump back in net, but try and treat them as much as a field player as possible. Uh, organize to maintain the social distancing. Again, bring up the importance of the organization piece. Smooth transitions with minimal setup or breakdown. Lots of technical repetition, okay? Um, and make sure it's developmentally appropriate. Integration of competition and fitness while maintaining social distancing. So I think you can still implement things like competition, and then through that competition, you can almost develop that, that fitness and make it fun within these sessions. And then fun and development. So these are, uh, I'll show you two sessions that I, I kind of put together. And it, if you go to the US soccer website and you go to phase one uh, with the grassroots recommendations, they have a couple sample sessions that you can use as well. Uh, but here, this is one is for nine players. Uh, if you go on the, again, U.S. soccer, they have it for eight players, but I think most of us in our reality will have nine players and a coach. Uh, physical, again, first we'll start with a technical warm-up, physical activation, technical ball work combination. Uh, again, player within their own space and at the discretion of coach will perform juggling, quarter skills, uh, moves to be defender, a lot of cuts and change direction. That gets us into, again, activity one. The objective is just to improve passing and combination play. Uh, groups of three, player in the middle is the one who's specifically working, body shape, uh, again, passing receiving skills. You can start to progress into more combination play from this. Each player will get a chance to be in the middle. Uh, then you go into activity two, which is uh, more of a 2v1, 
with also respecting the social distancing. So it's kind of like a keep away where the player, again, you score a point every time you can get it to the player on the opposite side, player in the middle is trying to cut off the ball. Um, so again, trying to just integrate a little bit of, of, of passive opposition, but also you get a lot of that fitness in those tight spaces as well. And then activity three, I'm sure you've done activities like this for more maybe defensive shape, uh, but this is again, more of a six three three activity where uh, the two teams on the outside are trying to split uh, the team in the middle and they score a point every time they can play the ball on the ground uh, from one side to the other. This uh, sample session is for U13 and older and, and to be honest, it's probably more specifically for U16 and older. Uh, so here I start out, and again, it's based on your reality. So there's uh, uh, rebound boards and things in here and poles. So that might not be, again, realistic for you. But uh, physical activation and agility and ball work. So the players, each with the ball, are manipulating it through cones, around poles, working on, again, keeping tight ball control and manipulation, lots of cuts and change of direction, and finishing on the mini uh, pug goals. Uh, you flow into, again, a uh, simple passing square uh, where you focus on, again, body shape, first touch, accuracy, and way to pass, and you progress that into more combination play, and then again, something a little more functional. Uh, activity two, you split into two groups, uh, and obviously both groups wouldn't go at the same time, but you work on different uh, shadow play, different patterns, uh, different roles within it and you focus on certain functional techniques within it, and then you bring it all together for activity three, where it's essentially, again, with the eight players we're working with, the front three, the seven, nine, 11, the 10, six, and eight, and then three and the two, the two outside backs in, in a four, three, three formation. And now you can give the a little more creativity and freedom to players to create, again, um, passing patterns and, and some patterns of play within the attacking half to, to create goal scoring opportunities and hopefully finish them back there. Phase three, duration, no greater than 90 minutes. Um, you know, so this is, we're talking now, again, ideally what soccer should look like, hopefully when we get back to it, where we have the competition, we, we got the shin pads on, uh, we have a little bit of closer proximity social interaction and, and soccer as we knew it. Uh, lots of small, in, in my, and this is just my opinion, okay? for that first session back. Small side games, lots of social interaction. It's gotta be competitive. It's gotta cater obviously to the needs of players you're working with. Uh, I big focus on the, the players' fitness levels and seeing where they're at. Um, but just making sure that again, that there's a high volume of touches and, and most importantly, that's fun. You know, I, I think for that first session back where, where you can go kind of full throttle with, with no, real restrictions, except for obviously the, the COVID-19 protocols, I think you need to give it back to the players, you know, and, and I would say this, like I said, I coach uh, college and I also coach U13 on the boys' side. I would say the same thing for both age groups. Uh, you need to get, give it back to the players. It needs to be fun. It needs to be interactive. It needs to be collaborative. The kids need to remember why they fell in love with playing the game in the first place. So, I give you a couple of different ideas um, and things that, that I thought about, which would be good environments to, to use in maybe that first full session back. Uh, street soccer. And, you know, just giving the game back to the players. Let the players pick the teams. Let them create the rules. All small sided games. Uh, small sided games are great. Obviously, uh, they have to make quick decisions. You know, the, the cognitive piece is, it, it has to be rapid. Uh, it's a high volume of repetitions. Uh, you're always involved. Um, you know, it's a great environment. It's fun. The kids love it. Uh, 2v2 festival. So a friend of mine who is the technical director, or assistant, I'm sorry, assistant technical director for S South Texas Youth Soccer, um, they utilize this, and, and they've utilized it a lot with conjunction with Houston Dynamo, uh, 2v2 festival model, which uh, was made famous by the Belgian FA after Belgium started to have a, a little bit of failure after the 98 World Cup, and in 2000 euros and they found that it was a, a big developmental piece with regards to uh, developing technical uh, competencies in the youth. Um, and they attributed a lot to kind of the golden generation. So if you want any information on the 2v2 festivals, uh, you, I can more than happy get you those, those links and, and those resources. Uh, PPP session. Uh, again, one of our bread and brother obviously for the, for the grassroots, but it's a player-centric uh, methodology and playing model. 
Um, again, where the, it's a lot of touches, a lot of creativity, a lot of repetition, a lot of coaching intervention. Players are always playing. They're always solving problems. Five-a-side tournament. And then if it's appropriate, like I said, just having kids play in 11 side. And then as we start to uh, dissipate and we start to, to leave, uh, some of the uh, procedures for departure, maintain social distancing when uh, cooling down. Uh, obviously, keep in mind with wearing the masks when you're in a little bit closer proximity with reviewing. Um, follow those pre-designated pickup schedules and routines. Try and make sure you always disinfect everything when it comes to equipment and obviously the high volume areas, uh, the bench, the bathrooms, concession stands, locker rooms and so forth. Uh, and as best as possible, no, no fist bumps, no hugs, no, no high fives, nothing of that nature. So post game review, we're gonna do a little Q and A for, uh, to check for understanding. Okay, so we can see where people uh, were at with regards to the presentation. So be ready to present by calling you. Uh, the state of New York is currently in phase two of its reopening, except for which two Eastern New York regions? Uh, Jared Mitchler. Who wants to volunteer? I'll, we'll do it this way. I don't know, maybe people got up. Who wants to volunteer? If you wanna just unmute yourself. So the state of New York is currently in phase two of its reopening, except for which two Eastern New York regions? Who's got the answer? Looking for brave souls here. Chat box, we got New York City, that's one. Who's got number two? Come on. Long Island be the Long, second. Long Island, very good. I like the collaboration. Perfect. So Long Island and New York City. Question number two, what is the maximum number of participants allowed for U.S. Soccer Phase 1 training session? Who wants to just unmute themselves and volunteer? Don't be shy, guys. Do you have any volunteers? Maybe you want to type into the chat box. Nine plus one, perfect, 10 total. I'll give it, I'll give it to, to Malcolm, 10 and a coach. Congrats, you're on fire, Malcolm. And then question number three, last one. Besides safety, what is the number one thing that needs to be in your first practice back to be successful? And again, this is maybe my opinion, but I, I think we're, we're missing the boat if, if this is not the most important piece. So besides safety, what's the number one thing that we need? Let's see the brave soul to have fun, to be enthusiastic. Perfect. Awesome, guys. You guys did a great job. So here's the resources uh, that I used uh, to go back to some of those health information. It was COVID-19 tracker. Um, if you have any questions with regards to maybe what phase we're in. Uh, but again, this is kind of an open document. It's always changing. It's always uh, progressing and evolving. Uh, but it, I mentioned too that ussoccer.com, uh, the, the guide for phase one grassroots that can be found uh, is a great resource to use. Here's my contact information. So if you have any questions, you, you can reach me at my personal email or my cell phone. Uh, like I said, if you want some of that information on that 2v2 festival, that those are really fascinating thing that they did. And, and it seems to... Uh, have reaped a lot of benefits with, with regards to their player environment. So any questions to wrap up? I'm gonna stop sharing my page here. Okay. Well guys, if there's no, no questions, I, I really wanna just first say thank you for taking the time to, to come on the session. I wanna say thank you to Tim uh, Bradbury for allowing me to uh, run this presentation. It was a lot of fun and and hopefully you guys got some information with regards to the, the safety procedures and protocols and and what that first session is, is going to look like when we get back. But um, I, I know uh, I probably speak for the rest of uh, the group when I say um, the, you know the 
horizon is, is almost there and we're almost uh, out of the woods and we can get back to what we love, which is, which is coaching uh, the beautiful game. So everyone stay safe and healthy and uh, please enjoy the rest of your week. And I appreciate you guys for again, jumping on. Thank you very much guys. Be safe and have a good night. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.